Well, welcome to Machina Labs. Uh, we are building the next generation of manufacturing floors here using robotic craftsmen enabled by robotics and artificial intelligence. We have a multidisciplinary team of engineers working on fields from AI to software to mechanical engineering to material science um, to really build a future where anybody with a great idea uh, can build their parts without having to spend money in building a factory. What led to the demise of manufacturing in the United States uh, partially was cheap labor. Automation, a method of scientific production that has been developed through years of hard work, work embodying the highest engineering principles. We perfected a lot of methods of manufacturing here in the United States. A lot of early automation techniques were done here. And then I think at some point it became commoditized uh, for the need that we had at the time. And it was easy to just, you know, take it to somewhere else, to some other location that the labor was cheaper and, and do it there. I think what we didn't realize was that if we get rid of this skill and put it somewhere else over long term, we just got to forget how to do things. And I think that's partially what happened. So cheap labor was a big part of it, but I think the way manufacturing technologies are, the nature of the manufacturing technology also led into uh, centralization of a lot of these techniques outside the United States. You know, if you have a manufacturing technique that cannot uh, accommodate new designs, cannot accommodate new material, it's very static, it's very dependent on the design and the material that you're trying to manufacture. What ends up happening is that in order for the factory that builds that part become economical, you have to make a lot of that part. You have to build basically a factory that's very specific for that part of material. A lot of investment goes into that factory. So you better make a lot of that part before that past factory pays for itself. That means that factory needs to bake parts for the rest of the world. That's one area that personally I'm really excited about hopefully solving is not just the economical aspect of manufacturing, but the cities that used to have manufacturers, a lot of them lost it and the economy that was built around that city uh, and that manufacturing operation died with it. You see this a lot in some of the towns in Midwest uh, or East Coast where you go and there was a, let's say, a factory that was doing a certain type of a car. The biggest motor plant in the world is needed to make the million six-cylinder engines demanded annually by the American people. That car became obsolete and because that factory was not flexible to change into manufacturing something else, mm. that factory died out. When the factory becomes an obsolete uh, and it's cheaper to move this factory and, and start a new version of it into some other location, the people who were there working those factories obviously all lose their jobs and, and you know, the economy breaks it around, that city dies. Three, two, one. When I left school, I joined uh, SpaceX. One main challenge that we had was that every time you had to build a part, you pretty much have to build a factory around it. Every tool, every machinery that goes into shop floor to make Falcon 9, to some extent was built for the size, the diameter of the Falcon 9, for the material that goes into the Falcon 9. So the moment you want to make a larger rocket, a fatter rocket, that means go change all of your machinery, right? And that's a very big investment. I mean, if you think about a company like SpaceX, which is on the forefront of manufacturing, you would say, they had two product families to this point. There's a Falcon product family, and then there is a Starship product family, which the Starship hasn't yet, you know, become productionized. And this is a company that has been around for more than 20 years. They were, it was founded in 2001. In the span of 20 years, it was only feasible to basically make one and a half product line because it's so expensive to change things. And that significantly affected the speed of innovation, right? How fast can you iterate with your design, come up with new ideas because if you didn't have the factory to build it, it didn't make sense to come up with those ideas. So when I was at SpaceX, those ideas are starting to kind of form around like, well, this is a huge bottleneck around innovation. That got me excited about 3D printing in that, in that moment. Um, and so after SpaceX, I joined a company, one of the early members, a company called Relativity Space. This actual thing is launching to space and it's by far the largest 3D printed product really of any type ever made that's gonna fly. 3D printing had this promise of giving that flexibility. You could come up with a design and then manufacture it in a matter of hours or days. 
which is fantastic. It completely resolves that issue that we talked about. But the main challenge was 3D printing still doesn't have a very wide reach in terms of the type of parts it can do. It can do certain type of parts very well, but certain other type of parts that are dominated in the manufacturing industry are not really accessible to 3D printing. Um, and that's where I started thinking about, okay, we need something a little bit more um, widespread. It can do different types of parts, different types of material. Having been a craftsman and sheet shaper in the past, it was very clear. Before current factories, you used to have craftsmen. And craftsmen were very flexible. It was a very good paradigm to start thinking about. Craftsmen can pick up a tool, has a very creative mind, and apply that tool very creatively to a piece of material and make all kinds of parts. One day, it can use a hammer to you know, transform a sheet of metal into a shield. The next day, it can pick up a same hammer, apply it to a rod of material and make a sword. So Craftsman had that flexibility. The challenge was that it didn't have a lot of throughput. So when we created the next generation of manufacturing floors 100, 100, 200 years ago, we kind of lost that flexibility of the craftsmanship. But what we gained was throughput. We could do the same thing over and over again fast. But the challenge was that we couldn't iterate. So we started thinking about, can we get that concept of craftsmanship, but scale it? So combining robotics and artificial intelligence, we can replicate what craftsman does to so gain that flexibility back but also be able to scale it. So that was a corner uh, stone idea behind Machina Lab. And from there, we had to start thinking about, okay, in what sector of manufacturing do we wanna apply it? The natural choice was 3D printing, but we realized 3D printing market is pretty small. Um, in order for us to make an impact, we need to go after a portion of the market that's large enough to give us a big, big impact. <laughs> So we started from sheet forming. Sheet, sheet forming is the biggest metal processing sector out of all, right? Most of the parts you see day to day are sheet metal parts, form sheet metal parts. You know, when you're driving in a freeway, you're pretty much sitting in a sea of sheet metal, form sheet metal parts. So it was a very good marketplace to start from. Big market, big opportunity. So there's a lot of challenges when you start thinking about building a robotic craftsman. One is, you need to create similar dexterity as humans have. That means we need to be able to manipulate material the same way humans can do, ideally with much higher force and much higher accuracy. But you also need to create what happens in the mind of the craftsman. And that's a piece that AI comes into play. So we're kind of right now at the moment where both of these are mature enough. We have had robotic systems for a few decades. They have been maturing for a long time. Artificial intelligence is getting to the point where we can replicate a lot of ways that humans think. So they're both at the right moment for us to combine these two and give us a robotic craftsman. But the other piece was, you know, we had to also just make sure that this process can scale. So we had to make sure that the robotic system is cheap enough that you can replicate hundreds of them without having to spend a lot of money. So those were some of the other equations in our mind where we were choosing uh, this technology. Our robotic craftsman cell today can uh, start it from forming sheet metal parts. So in the morning, you can form aircraft panels. Uh, in the afternoon, you can make car hoods. But the system is flexible enough. We can basically work with many different industries. Right now, we work with aerospace in building fighter jets. Well, we also work with automotive, making cars, car doors, car panels. Um, we have been working with heavy industries, doing different parts for tractors and combines. How do we bring manufacturing back in the United States? I don't think we can bring the same old manufacturing we were doing 60 years ago back because the cost of labor and the type of labor that we have and the type of opportunities that that labor has is not the same anymore. So I don't think they're gonna go back into the factories and do the same thing over and over again in assembly lines. So in order to enable that distributed manufacturing and bringing and reshoring it back in the United States, um, there's gonna be significant amount of innovation in automation and flexibility. You know, one day can make part A and the next day can make part B without having to change that factory, change the workforce of that factory. So I think most of the, most of the change is gonna be around agility and automation. A lot of discussions today around automation, AI, and robotics is that the current factory workers will lose their job. That is a myth. We already see in our factories and other factories that are using these more agile technologies, we are hiring a lot of people to get to do this. The skill set will change. They need to know different things. They need to be able to work with robots. They need to be able to program robots. They need to learn much more software and softer skills. But we actually need more people. And the reason for it is that if 
Flexible automation and factoring of futures become a reality. The market size significantly increases for physical products. We're talking about drones. We're talking about different types of rockets. We're talking about exploring the cosmos and the universe. We need to build way more, orders of magnitude more, exponential growth in terms of what we manufacture. Automation would enable that. This opens up new markets. And with new markets, we're gonna have new workforce. I actually think more people will be employed in manufacturing with these technologies. If you look at the past 20 years and think about what was the real reason we had this explosion in software solutions, number of apps developed, number of websites, number of services that are available online. The core enabler was infrastructure automation, also known as data centers. There are almost half a million of these server computers. This really is the infrastructure for almost everything that we're engaged in today. If you were in 1980s and you wanted to develop a new software solution, you had to actually go build a data center, put hardware, real computers in it, and then scale it. There was a lot of capital expenditure that you had to do to host your software, run your computation, and make it available to your customers. But today, that doesn't exist anymore. You can be a small company of team of two, three people, develop a software, go to a data center as a service, services like AWS or Shore, and rent thousands or even hundreds of thousands of computers to deploy your application. That's actually how LLMs came about, right? We had very small groups of researchers in Stanford or in OpenAI had access to a pool of thousands of computers to run their calculations and build these models. So that enabled this exponential growth in the software. But today in the hardware industry, we don't have that. If you want to build a drone, a new airplane, a new fighter jet, a new rocket, you have to go build your factory. You have to go build your infrastructure that is specifically built for your application. We are working on technologies that can create that same effect that the data center had on manufacturing. With robotic craftsmen, you can have a facility that can have thousands of these robotic cells, the same way a data center has thousands of computers in it. And now you can program each of these robotic craftsmen to do different operations and get flexibility, but also throughput out of it, the same way you get you know, flexibility throughput and computation out of a data center. The world that this technology is building is what actually excites most of the people in this company. A lot of us, when we came out of school, if you wanted to work on something that's impactful in the hardware space, we had to join very large companies. I had to join SpaceX. Some of the other folks had to join Ford or other large companies who had the ability to make those ideas a reality. With technologies like ours, if they become widespread, you can imagine a world where you are a designer, you can come up with an idea for the next drone. You can go to a website, upload your designs, and get guided through how you can manufacture that without ever stepping into a factory. And then the right factory in the right location gets programmed, gets the right number of cells to manufacture the right part, and then ship it to you. That world is a world where any idea could get a chance to become a reality, despite of if the owner of the idea that the person who came up with it had the ability to build the factory or the resources to build the factory. That's the world I would love to be able to live in. Because I think the truly human experience is that self-expression. And if you can remove boundaries and hindrances for self-expression, I think everybody will have a much more fulfilling life.